in all sorts of places, and every single time I've made the same argument that I'm, I've more or less run past you today, and every single time I've won the case. <laughs> So these judges look at the evidence that I bring forward. They look at the papers that I bring from Chernobyl, from Sweden, from the things that I've been telling you about, from the Irish Sea and all the rest of it, and say, yes, right, it was obviously a load of crap, you win the case. And these are judges. So these, these are judges, and sometimes they're juries. I won a, a jury case in, in um, the West Midlands, a very, very, very big case, about some guy who, who died of cancer after working in Iraq and was contaminated with depleted uranium. And, we, and, the, and the coroner, it was a coroner's inquest uh, into why this guy died, what was his cause of death. And so I went in there with all my stuff, and the military of defense came in with all their stuff, saying all of these things, all of the stuff you've heard, you know, all the stuff that George Monbiot talks about, about credibility, I couldn't believe this nutcase, look at him, all that stuff. And we won the case. The jury found in favor of, of the view that this guy had died because he was contaminated with depleted uranium, and they threw out all of the ICRP stuff about how it couldn't be so because the dose was too low. So I have to say that in the general court, in the, in the judicial system, we win this case again and again and again and again. So that is some sort of indication, I think, really, that, that what I'm saying is true. But I mean, as some other person said, on the precautionary principle, even if there was a possibility that it was true, the possibility that all these millions, well, not millions, but hundreds of thousands of children are going to suffer cancer, and their parents are going to suffer cancer, and all sorts of other diseases, is too horrifying to contemplate. So somebody should do something even on the basis that it might be true. Oh. General Secretary for the Sea Regional Radioactivity Risk, and uh, we've been working together with Chris for a couple of years. Because in uh, Baltic Sea Region, they are planning to put these nuclear waste cemeteries. They are saying only for Sweden, only for Finland, but we know that they are sort of planning it international because there are all, all people from big, big nuclear industry people coming investigating. And it's on the, on the very shore of Baltic Sea. It's impossible location. It is uh, not rational at all, and it is wrong on all levels. This uh, <coughs> KBS3 model of uh, nuclear waste cemetery they are building it doesn't hold on something scientifically in all the levels of its uh, method. But the point is <coughs> that we have to get to the core of economics of this because when when people say. I know that Chris is doing all this research totally for free. He doesn't get money for this. And who else can do research without money? We live in an economical system where we have a, a slave, a wage slavery. So yeah. if we don't get money, we can't eat. Yeah? So, so this is an impossible situation that these guys are telling about. Yes, there is no, not enough research because everybody who does this research has to do it totally for free. And about scare, scare mangering, I will give you real facts. This is not scare mangering. But we have a ghetto in Japan right now. And people don't have money again to move away from there. And we talk one of the richest countries of the world, Japan. So think about all the nuclear waste there is on our mother earth. Of all these thousands of places, of these pools that Chris described, the pools with nuclear waste that are dependent on to be cooled. They are dependent on electricity. So imagine, Japan is cooking, or several, several pools there are cooking, they can't stop it at all. And if we have sort of a solar flare that can bring out all the devices out, and imagine, there, there can be months until they get it all right, all these nuclear pools will be cooking. And this is not scare mangle, this is just what we have created. And all this nuclear waste, they use only 4% of the uh, radio nuclides in the nuclear waste. 96% are still in the waste when they put it into the basin, in, in, into, into the pool. And it all will be cooking as Fukushima is cooking now. If we have some solar flare, you know, we, this uh, issue of nuclear waste is really primary issue of humanity. And all these uh, atomic energy uh, power stations, they are all the time spitting out this waste. They are producing boom, 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 boom. It's all growing, growing, growing. And, they're, they're talking, wow. and I, in the end, I just wanted to, to 
for this man. And all the people who do this research applaud because they do this totally without money. Please give a hand for you. Um, I just want to make two quick points about uh, nuclear power and, and a question about Hinckley. Um, the first point is sort of a, it's a sort of ideological, uh, Chris is talking about you either support or dissupport nuclear, slightly from an ideological point of view. And I just wanted to try and clarify that in my mind. In my mind. Um, if everybody is paying for energy every month, you know, 60, 100 quid energy bills every month, if that all goes to the big three or four electricity generating companies through nuclear, everybody, that's essentially like a permanent energy tax. Every family in the country, 20 million houses, is going to be paying that every month to a nuclear company. And that seems to be basically the government's plan at the moment. It's a big problem. Spend £8 billion on a few concrete boxes and that should supply um, electricity for a bit. The alternative to that which is a highly centralised method of power generation and economics is renewables, is allowing and encouraging every house in the country, all 20 million, to be providing their own electricity and to keep that money themselves. It's a really basic choice. We have to realise that our whole society depends on energy generation, so whatever method of energy generation therefore controls the economics of our society and therefore controls the politics of our society. Okay, so if we have centralised energy generation, we're going to have centralised economics and we're going to have centralised politics. If we have the alternative of decentralised power generation, decentralised economics and therefore decentralised politics and the sort of green future that I think we're all involved with will come along. So I just would like to stress that it really is quite an ideological perspective and we're at a key time at the moment where we decide which way we go. The second point I want to make is our civilization is a couple of thousand years old. The oldest civilization we know about is about seven or eight thousand years old, the sort of Incas and, and, and these people. And we see there are some amazing artifacts left seven or eight thousand years later. Our civilization, 2,000 years of Christianity, about 150 years of industrialized civilization. I just want to ask what future civilizations in a few thousand years are going to think of our little 150 year chaos mongering. We're going to be leaving large and growing parts of the, the planet not really habitable. And a quick question about Hinkley Point, I'm sorry, just a quick question about Hinkley Point. I live, have lived in Somerset for some time. My some, mother lives in Somerset for 30 years. She's developed breast cancer, which she's in remission, but it's been a fairly traumatic time for her and the family. Touch wood, she's right. She lives about in, in near Glastonbury, about 35 miles from Hinkley Point. Is there a connection? You mentioned around Burnham and Sea, the cancer rate has gone up. Is there a, a connection in the broader area in Somerset and Southwest? Well, the, problem, the answer to that question is that you don't know. Um, that, that there's a significant fall off uh, with, with, in breast cancer with distance from, in breast cancer mortality, because we're not allowed to see the data for our incidence. This, this is another uh, shameful situation that the incidence rates of cancer in small areas are not permitted to be seen by independent researchers. But we can look at mortality. What it shows is that there is a significant fall off with distance. By the time you get to 35 kilometers, I should think that it's fallen off pretty well, Shane. So I, I think although you, you, it's entirely possible, because it's entirely probabilistic, you understand, that, that it is connected, uh, I think at 35 kilometers probably you could say that, a re that, that the rate of the people living there is roughly the same as the rate uh, in the rest of Somerset. Unless she lives near the river, I mean, because actually this, this doesn't fall off with distance, it falls off very much in terms of, of, of high land and low land. So if she lives very close to the river, then that would, in, that, would, that would make it more likely that it was Hinkley Point. Because we know, having studied it, that people who live uh, uh, near the river Parrot, for example, have much higher levels of cancer than people who live on the high land, in the wards on the high land. 
and I think that's due to the contamination of the river Parrot from Radio Newcards coming from Hankley Point and coming up with the tide. Uh, it was quite extraordinary for breadth of lung cancer, in fact, that the rates of lung cancer are twice as high in, in the wards along the Parrot uh, as they are in the wards that are in the next ones out from there and the wards on the highland. It's very, it's very interesting that that, that, that that occurs. Yeah. So I, I think probably no is the answer, but certainly Hinkley Point has caused increase in breast cancer in the down windows and people living nearby. No question about that. But and it gets around. Like 10 kilometers. It gets around the whole hemisphere. Well, of course, yeah, it gets around all over the place, you know, but the problem is, see, the problem with nuclear is that it's invisible. I go to Fukushima, I walk around, the birds are singing, you know, the grass is growing, everything looks absolutely normal. It looks like it does here. Unless you've got a Geiger counter, or if you were some Martian and had some eyes that could detect gamma radiation, you wouldn't see anything at all. But when you get your bike account, right, then it starts to show all sorts of radioactivity and you put the gamma spectrometer there and you see what the isotopes are, you realize that you're walking through a radioactive environment. And then it's even worse than that because you get contaminated and then you don't die. It's not like somebody stabs you and you fall over. It's like somebody stabs you and five years later you get cancer and die. So it's really quite a difficult thing to deal with. In, or any in other disease. Causality, yeah, sure. Anyway, I think really we've now come to the end of this. I mean, I've been attributed to sort of wind it all up now. So I think we're... What? Oh, yeah, so one more. Can I tell us more about the contamination on the land at Hinkley Point? Contamination of the land at Hinkley Point, yeah. Yeah. They have, yes, well, we've expected that. It's a question rather than I, I, a, a about 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 it. It what you said with the addiction of uh, cancers around the Fukushima in the next few years will be uh, 400. What would the normal expectation be if Fukushima had happened? Oh no, uh, the, the, yeah, the normal expectation is 462,000. So your prediction that there will be more? Uh, double. Double. Yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah, sure. That, that's right. I mean, that's how you do it. You, it's very simple. If you take the Tondel approach, you say that it's 11% increase in cancer in northern Sweden for every 100 kilobecquerels of cesium on the ground. So then you just work out the number of kilobecquerels on the ground in the Fukushima area, work out the population, you multiply that by, by 11%, and you get 66%, and then you multiply that by the expected cancer rate, and that gives you the prediction. Can you follow that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a, a Japanese son who's just returned from Japan, so he's been living in Tokyo while all this has been happening. Uh, it's been very, very difficult to convince him uh, because he's so Japanese. <laughs> Uh, and the Japanese culture doesn't allow dissension in the way that we do. I realize how very difficult it is for many people to actually take on board what's going on and to investigate this. And when I when I had to leave Japan because I couldn't stand some of the, um, that, that sense of having to agree collectively how things are um, many years ago, uh, I come back here and I see actually we're slowly, slowly drifting into the same state. And we need to really watch out that we have this fantastic gift in this country, in Europe, of um, being able to stand up and freely speak about things. If you don't get that in the same way in Japan, it's very hard, it's quite a struggle for people to speak out against the system. We, we need to do all we can to enliven our awareness and to spread our dissension. Okay, the one kind of point that I wanted to make 